All stories are shrouded in kernels of truth, each a grain of sand in life's ever-hastening hourglass, including mine. When I tell you my secrets, if you must know them, for well, they are not for the faint of heart. Stop me if I dive too deeply or, or recount too savagely the memories and visions that have shaped me. Look away if you must, because if you come with me on this journey, you may not like what you see, for we will dance with the supernatural, the macabre, the devil himself. And you will know me better. Poe Evermore is a historical fiction horror podcast from the minds behind the dead and SCP archives. Coming September 19th, a Bloody FM production. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Novak, and I'm here to tell you some true tales from your fellow listeners. Just a reminder before we begin, you have until December 3rd to get my limited edition merch, link in the show notes, and after December 3rd, it is gone forever, and the art is super cool, so please go check it out again, link in the show notes. Let's begin, shall we? First up is from Francis with a Glitch in the Matrix story, one of our favorites. I was telling a friend about this experience and they directed me to Reddit to share it, but I also thought I'd send it in to you as well because I'd love to hear your thoughts. Love the show. Me and my fiance, Vicky, love to relax listening to you in the evening. Thank you. This isn't so much scary as confusing. And though it happened in 2019, I still remember it like it was yesterday because of how much of an impact the experience had on me. I've never experienced a glitch in the matrix before this or since. In November 2019, before anyone knew about COVID-19 in the UK, both me and my fiancé had it. We didn't know what it was until months later, though. COVID hit my fiancé worse than me, and all she wanted was to eat pastry. I was actually able to get out of bed at least, so while I still felt like death warmed up, I felt like a walk to the store was still doable for me, especially as I could get the bus back home. The walk from the house to the store would take 35 minutes on a good non-virus infected day. I'm chronically ill with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and I am also asthmatic. I promise these small details are important. The walk to the store took me a little longer as I had to keep stopping to hack up a lung, catch my breath, and use my inhaler. I acquired the pastries and some sore throat medication before making my way to the bus station beside the store and finding that buses weren't running properly because many drivers were off sick due to the mystery virus that was affecting so many people. We didn't know anything about COVID-19 until February 2020. I text my fiancé right as I start walking from the bus station that I'm on my way but walking, so I'll be back when I'm back. She replied almost immediately with an okay and to take my time. Again, this small detail is important. She received and replied to my text within 10 seconds of me sending it, and I remember looking at my watch as it flashed up with the time of 2.23pm. At least it wasn't going to be dark as I walked home. I put in my headphones and started my music, which I remember distinctly was a 10 plus minute song, and began walking. I remember reaching the edge of the store building and turning a corner onto a back path, and then I remember walking up the garden path and opening the front door to my house. My fiance had come downstairs to get a drink as I had walked through the door and was extremely confused as she saw me. She told me to check the time on the message I had sent. The message I had sent her to say I was on my way home had been sent six minutes previous. 
She had replied to me almost instantly, so the message hadn't failed and then sent later. If this had been the case, I would understand a messed up time scale. I checked my watch again. 2.29 and 7 seconds. There is physically no way I could have made it home. The route, with shortcuts, was still a three-kilometer walk. We play Pokemon Go, so we knew the distance, in six minutes. Even if I ran, there is no way it could have happened. I was also still only halfway through the song that was playing when I set off. I wasn't particularly out of breath, any more than I already was due to having COVID. I didn't have a coughing fit upon arriving home. I didn't need my inhaler, and considering the way back was partially uphill, it would have been needed. And the walk back always brought me out in a sweat, but I wasn't sweating at all. The only explanation I can come up with is that I teleported somehow. I'm not complaining because I definitely was not looking forward to the route home, even with shortcuts. I was estimating an hour at the speed I was moving at that point. We've often talked about the experience since, and my fiancé put forward that I put in my headphones and just lost track of the walk on autopilot. But that still doesn't account for the three kilometers taking me six minutes. I did a five kilometer charity fun run once and even speed walking, it still took me an hour. And my music was still playing the same song, which was only halfway through its 10 plus minutes. It was also on shuffle, so it wouldn't have repeated. Just as an aside, the song was Inagata De Vida by Iron Butterfly. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one because it still confuses us. From Francis. Thank you so much, Francis. And that is a mystery and a very perfect glitch in the Matrix story. I hope you also submitted it to Reddit because I'd be interested to see what those folks say over there too because I'm sure I'll come across it in my late night reddit scrollings and you know stuff like this these like glitches in the matrix and these time slips which time slips you know a lot of times when I mention time slips they're kind of like you go to a different period of time almost like time travel-y but this I would consider also a time slip because what happened to the time and I love stories like this I have no idea I honestly as many of these as I've read and as fascinated as I am by them, you know, they can be explained away by, like your fiance said, maybe you were on autopilot, maybe you just didn't notice the time passing. We've all done that, especially while driving. I feel like it happens a lot, at least to me, where it feels like I'm just, I remember specifically this, the, I think it must've been like the first time it happened to me. I was babysitting in high school and I drove home and it, I just started driving on my own and I drove home and I remember just being like, wait a second, I was leaving their house and now I'm in my driveway and I don't remember driving here. And that happens a lot. But I, like I said, I think that one stuck with me just because it was like one of the first times it ever happened. But you have this weird semi proof of, you know, the song, the fact that you weren't winded, the fact that you have the text, you know, all strange. I wish I had more answers for you. And as always, my friends who are listening, if you have any theories, please feel free to leave them on social media. And I, I always mention this at the end of the show, so I'll throw it in the middle. Uh, the show is at Scary to Sleep on Instagram, Blue Sky, Twitter, Facebook. Did I miss, miss any? Instagram? Did I say Instagram? <laughs> There's so many now. Threads. It's on Threads as well. So any of those places you happen to be, or you can always email me. I'd love to hear your theories about this story in particular, of course, Francis's story, but also like this phenomenon in general. If you have any more insight, I would love to hear it. And I'm sure Francis would as well. So thank you, Francis, for your story. And let's move on to the next. Here we have a couple of stories from Nafisa. It was a late day in September during my middle school years. I was 13 and I was working on a dance routine that my dance teacher choreographed for an African school play. It was no later than four in the afternoon and it already was beginning to look dark as if the sun was being shielded with a blanket of some sort. It was too early for the sun to set. Now, I know this may seem typical because of nature's usual daylight savings and whatnot, 
But this wasn't that. This looked different. It felt different. It didn't seem to bother any of my classmates, so I chose to ignore it as well. By the end of practice, everyone started to pile out of the room and wait for their parents to come and pick them up. I lived nearby, so my mother never needed to worry about coming to get me after school. I started to walk down the hill away from the school and waved goodbye to my friends. I had a CD player as a kid instead of a phone like most regular people, so I plugged my wired headphones into it and began walking home. Where I lived, I was near a lot of forest-like areas, so there was a lot of open fields, trees, creeks, and large parks. Some of these parks barely had any streetlights to light the pathway, so most of the road home was pitch black and was only lit up by passing cars. Ignoring the world around me, I started to cross a bridge over a creek, Cobbs Creek. This is where things started to get weird for me. I froze in place, and it wasn't like I saw something and got frightened to where I couldn't move. No, I legitimately could not move a muscle. It felt as though someone had pressed pause on a remote, like my life was some sort of movie. And then, I saw it. Chills went down my spine as the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. At first glance, you would have thought, oh... It's probably just a bird or your mind just playing tricks on you in the dark. But the longer you looked, it began to take shape of something not of a bird, not even of a human. Prehistoric figure, maybe? I don't know. I just know that what I saw was pure evil. It was extremely tall, at least six or seven feet. Its arms were long and shoulders were somewhat pointed, like it had been wearing shoulder pads and balled them up in the process. Its fingers were narrow and jagged. It was dripping wet, like it had been sitting in the creek fully clothed, but it was too dark to tell, but I could feel its eyes back at me as I was forced to watch it. My heartbeat started to pound in my ears, and it looked like it was growing taller. That's when I knew it was coming towards me. I needed to get out of there. I needed to get away and get the hell out of there fast. But how? I couldn't move my feet. I couldn't swing my arms. I couldn't even so much as scream for help. I was defenseless. For sure this was going to be my last moment. I had my eyes tightly shut as I felt a tear roll down my cheek in fear. I felt my body trembling harder as this figure moved closer and closer to me. I whimpered for my life hoping that something or someone will get this thing's attention and let me go. And then, I heard a low growl behind me. For a second, my heart thumped heavily in my chest, and a sharp humming sound filled my ears. I slowly opened my eyes, and the one faraway figure was now hovering in front of me in a dark cloak. Its skin on its arms are decayed, fingernails black and chipped. I felt in that moment I have stood face to face with death. It reached out for me. Obey, it said in a distorted, low and deep voice. Its hand inched closer and closer as he repeated the same thing over and over. All I could hear was its voice. It felt as if I covered my ears. It still wouldn't have helped because it was in my head. I wanted to run. I needed to run. I just needed my feet to fucking move. And then it stopped. It disappeared, and I booked it home. Another event I remember encountering. As a child, I never really liked the dark. I had brothers that loved playing pranks on me when I was little, and it traumatized me to where I had to sleep with either a very bright nightlight or my room light on. One night, my brother decided to play a prank on me with a clown mask and these white glow-in-the-dark eye contacts. I hate clowns to this day because of his stupid pranks, but that's besides the point. I had to be no older than seven when this happened. I was going to the bathroom, and the second I opened my door, my brother was standing in the doorway of my room, in the dark, with his mask and glowing white eyes. He made a low grumble in his voice like the growl of an angry dog or something. He realized he scared me, turned the light on, laughed, and went on with his night. It seems funny now. But at that point in time, it didn't sit right with me. 
especially with the events that occurred right after. I yelled at him about it. He apologized and went back downstairs. I went to the bathroom and quietly walked back into my room. At this time, I shared a room with one of my older sisters. Let's call her Jay. My bed was a few feet away from the door while Jay's bed was closer to the wall on the other side of the room. She was already fast asleep. My brother was downstairs and our mother worked overnight that day. There was no one else in the house but us. I climbed back in bed when only a brief five minutes went by and something grabbed me by my ankle. I sat up and it immediately let go. I rushed out the bed to flick on the light. Nothing. There wasn't any sign of anyone else being in the room. I checked under the bed, both mine and Jay's. I checked the closet by my bed. The only thing I could think was how could someone move that fast and not get caught as soon as the lights came on. I figured it was all in my head and that I was just spooked because of my brother and his stupid pranks and got back into bed. It wasn't until it did it again, but this time it yanked me down a little, causing me to wince. I felt a sharp burning pain in my leg. I got out the bed again and turned the light on in panic. Still nothing. I looked down at my leg and seen a bruise wrap around my ankle and three scratches on top of my foot. I tried to explain to my mom and siblings what happened, but they didn't believe me. They said I was imagining things and that I need to stop watching scary movies before I go to bed. The bruise didn't prove anything to them either. They just said I simply roughhouse too much. To this day, it still creeps me out thinking about what grabbed me and what could have happened if I didn't react the way that I did. Sorry, these are getting long and I don't want to take up too much of your time. I do have many other stories of my experiences of certain things I've seen, heard, and felt. Hopefully, I can soon tell you about the woman in red I see in my dreams that causes chaos in my waking life. I hope you enjoyed reading and thanks again. Thank you so much, Nafisa, for those submissions. Those are very scary. The first one, before you described like the decaying arms and things, it almost sounded like a Mothman type interaction, just because it it looked like a giant bird at first, but then it it changed. So I don't know what that was. Some the woods creep me out. Anything in the forest. I mean, they're just mysteries we're not meant to understand. I think, but I'm glad you're okay. And for the second story, that is so, especially with the physical evidence, with the bruise on your foot and on your ankle and the scratches on your foot, that must have been terrifying, especially not to be believed because I'm sure you wanted to take some precautions. I mean, I'd want to put maybe like a circle of salt around my bed or something and to have no one believe you is so frustrating. And I'm sorry about that. But yes, if you have any more stories, please send them in and I'd love to hear them. And our next submission is from DR, and they would like to ask us a question. Hi and hello, I love your show, and it's helped me through my first months of art college. I have had this problem for well over a month now, and I would like some opinions. I've only ever shared this with one other, and they think it's hallucinations. I am not sure. So here goes my story. A year ago, my mom died of a medical condition, and ever since then, things haven't been the same. In the early stages of grief, I saw my mom everywhere I went, only in the corner of my eyes. After a month, however, she disappeared. However, now a year later, I see her everywhere, in the corner of my eyes or in front of me. She doesn't do anything, just stands there watching, which I was fine with and gotten used to or wanted to cry at the same time. Until this week. I'm alone at home whilst my dad is at work, so it's just me, my dog, and the TV for background noise. I was out walking my dog when it happened. My mom arrived as she always does, watching me in full view when all of a sudden, her face changed back to those last moments of her death. Eyes backwards, mouth open. I got so scared I wanted to cry, but after the walk was finished, she had vanished. She doesn't really speak to me, only watches, and only comes when I'm alone. What do you think? 
Are these hallucinations or something else? P.S. I have this thing with podcasts. Once I find one, I listen from the very first one all the way through, so I have no idea if you still do true horror or something like it. I just wanted to share my story with you. Well, DR, first of all, thank you, and second of all, I am so sorry to hear of your mother's passing. That has to be incredibly difficult, and you have my condolences. As for your uh, these appearances from her, I can't be sure what they are. They could be hallucinations. Um, this feels like something I'm not super comfortable ex- telling you what they could be. I don't even feel right um, hypothesizing what this could be, honestly. But I do think that I'm not sure where you're located. I don't know what country you're in or what your situation is. So um, I know sometimes this just isn't feasible, but if it is, and maybe if your art college has some sort of resources, I would highly recommend maybe trying to find some sort of counselor to talk to and some sort of, uh, you know, grief counselor or even someone at the school. Like, again, maybe ask the school for some resources because this is something that I can't imagine going through. It sounds like you're younger as well if you're just starting art college. Again, I'm not sure. I'm just kind of going off of context context clues. I apologize if I'm wrong. But if you are, I mean, even if you're not, even if you're not younger, um, I recommend maybe speaking to someone and about, you know, your mom and her passing. Someone, again, a professional of some sort, if you can. Again, I know resources are tight sometimes and... Our resources are hard to find sometimes and funds are tight sometimes. Again, I don't know what country you're in. It really depends on what you have access to. But if you can find some access to someone to speak to, then that's what I recommend. I think I just said that this uh, the same thing about five times, just reworded. So I'm going to stop repeating myself. But again, you have my condolences and I I just hope you find some some peace soon. I really do. Okay, so next are a few stories from Kim. Hi, Shelby. My name is Kim. I'm a guy from Norway, up in the colder part of the country, what we call Northern Norway. I'm a new listener to your Scare You to Sleep podcast and wanted to take a moment to say how much I appreciate your work. This is so sweet. Your voice is calming, even when the stories are terrifying, which makes for a really unique and enjoyable experience. Some of the stories people send send you are chilling and have stayed with me long after listening. Keep doing what you're doing. You're amazing. Well, thank you, Kim, and I will keep doing what I'm doing. I have a few stories of my own that I've been thinking about sharing for a while. These are true events that happened to me. These moments left me wondering about things we don't fully understand. I'm still trying to wrap my head around them, to be honest. Story 1. The Shadow Person on Vacation This happened sometime around 2012 or 2013, during a family vacation to Gran Canaria. It's a place we often visit, so I remember the trip well. We were staying in a small hotel apartment, not much space at all, just enough for my sister, my mom, and me. I can still picture the setup. When you entered through the front door, there was a small bedroom area immediately to the right where my sister and I slept. I can't remember if the beds were separated, but I was on the left side and my sister was on the right, closer to the small window. To get to the living room, we had to walk through a tiny kitchen that felt almost like a hallway just enough room to pass through. The living room itself wasn't big either. It had a couch that folded out into a bed, which is where my mom slept, and a glass door that led to a balcony. I remember the balcony overlooked the pool area and the activity space where people would hang out during the day. It was a short vacation, just a week, which was unusual because we were used to staying for two weeks. Everything seemed normal until one night when something happened that I still can't forget. I woke up in the middle of the night. I think it was because I heard tourists outside, people talking loudly, and the sound of their suitcases rolling across the ground. The light from outside made the room dimly visible, but it was still dark. I noticed my sister was awake, though I didn't turn around to see what she was doing. That's when I saw it. Near the entrance to the kitchen, I noticed a dark figure. It was standing there, motionless. At first, I thought it was my mom getting up to go to the bathroom. 
The shape was human, and I assumed she'd pass by any second. But she didn't. The figure just stayed there, lingering near the kitchen. It didn't move like a person. It was just there. I blinked, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. I even closed my eyes for a second, hoping that when I opened them again, it would be gone. But it wasn't. Instead, it seemed to slowly move toward me, and in a moment of panic, I shut my eyes tightly. When I opened them again, the shadow was gone. I lay there frozen, trying to understand what I had just seen. My heart was racing. I didn't say anything to my sister at the time, but the image of that shadow stayed with me for days. I couldn't stop thinking about it. The next day I told my mom and sister about it, but my sister, who had been awake during the whole thing, said she didn't see anything. I still wonder if it was what people call a shadow person. It didn't feel like sleep paralysis, which I've experienced before. This was different, clearer, more real. Story 2. The Shadow on the Frosty Road This second story happened much closer to home, in the winter. I live on a hill in a neighborhood where everyone knows each other. We have a shared mailbox stand a little way down the road from my house. To get to it, I have to walk past my parents' house, which is right next door, and then further down the road where my closest neighbor lives. The walk isn't long, but during this particular evening, It felt like an eternity. It was cold, and the ground was covered in frost, the kind that makes every step sound loud and clear. I remember the crisp sound of my boots crunching on the road as I made my way down to the mailbox. As I passed my parents' house, everything seemed quiet. There were no other sounds except for my footsteps. No wind, no other people. Suddenly, Something dark caught my eye. I froze. It felt like a shadow had just passed me, but I hadn't heard anything approach. In the dead of winter, you can always hear footsteps on the frosty ground, but there had been nothing. I looked around, trying to calm myself. Then, under the streetlight at the end of the road, I saw it. A dark figure, standing perfectly still beneath the light. But... It wasn't illuminated. Instead, it seemed darker than anything around it, almost like it absorbed the light. I felt a chill run down my spine. The air around me seemed colder. For a few moments, I stood there staring, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. My mind raced, convincing me that it was just a trick of the light. But when I blinked and looked again, the figure was gone. I didn't want to stay there any longer. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I turned around, practically running back up the hill to my house. I didn't get the mail that night. I told my parents about what happened, but they brushed it off as my imagination. Still, I know what I saw. I've walked that road a thousand times, but ever since that night, it's never felt quite the same. Story 3 The Shaking Bed This last story took place in my own home. I live in a house that was built in 2002, and before I bought it, a Christian family lived here. The man in the family was actually a distant cousin of mine, and he would travel to different congregations to speak about Jesus. The house always had a good energy about it, and I've never felt anything negative here. That is, until this one night. I had trained myself to sleep with the lights off, something I had never been able to do before. My bedroom was pitch dark except for a sliver of light coming from the hallway, which I left on. I was sound asleep when I woke up suddenly, feeling my bed shaking. It wasn't a slight tremble, it was like something was violently shaking the bed. I shot up, my heart racing, the room was dark and I couldn't see what was happening but I felt the intense vibrations. I was wide awake and fully aware of my surroundings. This wasn't sleep paralysis. I'd experienced that before, but this was different. This was real. Panicked, I jumped out of bed and turned on the light. The shaking stopped immediately. 
I stood there, my body trembling from fear, looking around the room. Nothing seemed out of place. I even checked under the bed, but of course, nothing was there. I was so shaken that I left the room and slept in the living room for the next few days. I couldn't bring myself to go back in. Even though nothing like that has happened again, I still wonder what caused it. The house feels safe and it's filled with good energy, but that one experience left me unnerved. That's all the stories I have for now. I hope you find them interesting, and if you decide to share them on your podcast, it would be amazing. Thank you for reading, and keep doing the great work that you do. Best regards, Kim. Thank you, Kim, for three wonderful stories. Let me go back one by one. I kind of thought about going, doing my little commentary in between each one, but I just wanted to keep your flow. You have a great flow. You have a great way of just telling your stories, so I didn't want to interrupt that. First of all, um, I felt very American in your first story when you were like, we took a short vacation. It was only a week. We usually do too, <laughs> because I don't think I've ever been on a two-week vacation apart from like You know what? Even my summer camp when I was a kid was not two weeks long. And uh, I realized it was making me real excited. I I got in my head about it and I was like, wow, when's the last time I took even a week vacation? And it was probably, again, as as a child or a teenager. And I don't think I've... I think the only vacation I've taken as an adult... This is so sad. (laughs) As an adult has been like maybe two days to like San Diego one time and it was all like something I planned for a birthday party or for a birthday that uh it was and it was like not it was probably not even two full days and San Diego is like pretty near where I grew up (laughs) so that's like hardly counts and now I'm just sorry this is totally inappropriate I'm just off in my own head about the fact that I have not taken vacations as an adult and now I'm depressed about that. Thanks, Kim. No, it's not your fault. It is not your fault, Kim. Um, You're helping me reevaluate my life as a whole. But anyway, story one and story two feel very similar in that you saw like a shadow person. And that's really interesting to me because it almost feels not to evoke his name, but hat man-esque. I know you didn't say he was wearing a hat or it was a he or anything like that. But it almost feels like that, the way people describe their stories about seeing the hat man. And I know it's become a meme of like, I take 50 Benadryl every night so I can meet the hat man or because the hat man owes me money or whatever. But um, the hat man is a, is a paranormal phenomenon that has been documented. And I know a lot of skeptics out there. And by documented, I just mean a lot of people have written about it. And a lot of people have had similar stories that are just strangely, strangely line up. Uh, I've, in fact, I've spoken to several people who have had these stories that are really strange because they'll be from people who don't have never heard of the Hat Man, but they're like, "Oh, I used to see this thing when I was younger," and they describe the Hat Man, and then I, I can be like, uh, "That's like a thing that people see, and it blows their minds." It's happened to me a couple times where I've told people this. People who aren't into the paranormal. Anyway, I'm wondering if it's—I don't know. I wonder if it's something that follows you. I don't, not to, oh God, I just like put that in your head. That's not, that's rude of me. How rude of me. It sounds like you live alone as well. And as a fellow live aloneer, uh, I don't like it when people do that to me. So I apologize, but that's so strange. And your third story about the shaking bed, I've had something like that happen to me again. I was younger. I was, I don't know how old I was probably like 14 maybe. And my brother and I were staying at a cousin's condo for like a couple days. I don't even remember why we were just there and he had just bought this condo. And I remember the room we were staying in was like, had been the, like the family before that had been the teenager's room. And he had put all these weird symbols all over the wall that my cousin had to like paint over and plaster over. Cause they had been like carved or like plastered into the wall. And I remember seeing the teen because the family had come by to get like something out of the garage. And I remember he gave me like bad vibes but anyway, um, I was also a fellow teen though. So I don't know, maybe it was just cause I was angsty, but like, I remember waking up in the middle of the night my brother did too. And the bed was like shaking. It was shaking like crazy. And I remember telling uh, every time, every time I've told anybody else about the story, 
it's kind of written off pretty quickly because I am from Southern California and that's where this took place and we have a lot of earthquakes and a lot of times sometimes you'll wake up to an earthquake it happens a lot so a lot of people have been like it was an earthquake I don't think it was it sounds so similar to your story so similar and it's so re- hearing your reading your story was very eerie to me because again it just like brought back those memories and like it never happened again I mean, I didn't stay there that often, but still, it never happened again. I've never had anything like it happened since. And it's so interesting that you say, like, the rest of the house, and since then, it's all been good vibes. I don't know. I don't know what it is, because I've never figured out what mine was. So, I'm sorry, I have, like, no answers for anybody tonight. I don't have a lot of hypotheses for all of you. You're all giving me some real head scratchers. But uh, the shadow thing, though... That's eerie. The, having it stand under the light and feel like it's absorbing light is really interesting. And it's also a phenomenon I've heard of when people talk about shadow people or shadow figures. I'm not as well read upon, up on like shadow figures and things. So I'm not sure. But keep sending in stories if you keep seeing them. I hope you don't keep seeing them because it sounds terrifying and it sounds very hard to see them. And yeah, and you also mentioned that you have had sleep paralysis before. You just like, wow, all kinds of stuff. Have you have you tried saging? Have you tried uh, any sort of banishing spell? Have you tried any sort of like cleansing? Um, because it sounds like it, you would you might benefit from a little bit of a cleansing, like a uh, Olympia, uh, which is what my dad's family calls it because they're from Mexico. It's a cleansing. So yeah, I don't know. Look into something like that, maybe. At least that's what I would do. If I was in your situation, that's what I would do. But I I don't know. I'm. Is there a Norwegian version of that? Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, but good luck, Kim. And please continue to write in. And thank you for listening. And here we've come to our last story of the evening. This one's a good one. And for you skeptics out there, this one is not paranormal. This is a real world. Well, uh, God, I hate saying that because that, I just discredited my own belief in the paranormal. But you know what I mean. This is like a, this is a, a tangible one. This one's corporeal. I don't even think that's the right term for it. Um, but anyway this is for you skeptics out there because I like to throw in some every once in a while that have nothing to do with paranormal so you can just have your own little like oh that is creepy and I don't feel like writing a bunch of letters to Shelby so here this one's for you and for everybody else everyone else will enjoy this one this is from Ren and it's so scary this is the time I met a murderer in late August of 2021 I was working a waitressing job in a little college town in South Georgia and had a slow day. I had one customer on my patio who was an older man, and he made me feel very off. He only wanted coffee, and I struck up a conversation to try and get a decent tip. The conversation started off normal, but quickly devolved into him asking when I got off work and if we had cameras in the parking lot among other creepy comments about how I should date a rich man and not have to work this job. What stuck with me was that he bragged about how he was a trucker from Missouri who knew I-75 like the back of his hand. It almost sounded like a threat the way he said it. I bailed on the conversation. No tip was worth listening to that. I warned my co-workers to avoid him, but thought very little of it and finished out my shift. The next month, in September of 2021, it hit national news that Timothy Norton and James Phelps were arrested for the torture, murder, and dismemberment, among other atrocities, there were mentions of cannibalism, of Cassidy Rainwater of Lebanon, Missouri, in July of 2021. She was found three years after her death in the rural area of Dallas County, Missouri. She was kept in a cage, tortured, violated, disemboweled, and later dismembered. The story was horrific enough, but as I watched the mugshots pop onto the screen, I felt nauseous immediately because I realized I knew one of the men staring back at me. The man I met was without a doubt Timothy Norton, a trucker from Missouri. I think about Cassidy often, 
and it sickens me to think what he probably had planned for me if I hadn't listened to my intuition and told him we never had cameras in the parking lot. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much to those of you who submitted stories and happy Thanksgiving to my fellow Americans. We This is coming out on, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to schedule it to come out on Thanksgiving Day because you know what? Uh, for I mean, for one, there's <laughs> America. We are not, uh, you know, a monolith. So some of us don't celebrate Thanksgiving. And there are so many listeners of mine from around the world. And you don't either. <laughs> so I'm going to release this on Thanksgiving. And for those of you who do and are maybe having a tougher time at Thanksgiving this year due to reasons in this country, go on a walk. Listen to this. You know what? You've already listened to it. So uh, hopefully you went on a little little jaunt, a little stroll around the block to cool off. Put on this and this took you away for a little bit. And now... Get, get on back in there and eat some pie or get back on in there and tell them all to fuck off and then bounce. But take a pie on your way out because you deserve it. You deserve some pie. Uh, let's see. You can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Facebook. There are so many now, aren't there? I spent a little time this week making sure the show was available on all the social medias. I feel like I should probably get better about doing social media. Again, I mentioned it a while, like last episode, a couple episodes ago, I've come into some things recently where it's just, it would help out if I had more followers on social media, which sucks because that's stupid. And the world, the way the world works right now is a little stupid, but got to play the game, right? Got to play the game. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've never been on vacation as an adult. So, you know, got to play the game. So maybe I can go on vacation someday <laughs> after I pay off all my medical bills. America, <laughs> America. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to, sorry. I, I, I was actually annoyed with people this week for who are getting a little too uh, downtrodden about the state of things because sometimes I just want to escape and this is your escape. And I apologize for getting a little too, uh, uh, bleak right there. Let's move on. You know what? I baked. I didn't bake this week. I still had some cinnamon bread. And this is, again, I'm, I'm recording this ahead of time. So this is still cinnamon bread time. Or I just finished it a couple days ago, but like I haven't baked anything else yet. I might bake tonight. Tonight feels like a baking night. It feels like I should, you know, cream some butter and sugar together and throw something in the oven because it just feels like that kind of moment. It's cold feels good. Um, might do joy. The baker has a recipe I've mentioned before. It's two giant chocolate chip cookies and you can, I always add all kinds of crazy shit to them like pretzels or potato chips or coffee or, um, sometimes just plain. Sometimes I brown the butter. Uh, there it's a really versatile recipe. Again, that's joy. The baker look for her two giant chocolate chip cookies and bada bing, bada boom. You got two giant chocolate chip cookies. It's great. Um, what else? Let's see. Oh, you can submit. A, I, I got ahead of myself. I did baking corner so fast. I think I was trying to make up for bleak corner there that I threw in. Uh, apo- again, apologies. Apologies. You can send in your own true story submissions to scare you to sleep at gmail.com. Please put in your subject line, whether it's a true story or a fictional story, so I can categorize those into the right little sections and let's see oh yeah so please send in your fictional stories still taking fictional submissions i have been asked that and yes i am again apologies halloween time the month of october i always have it pre-planned out then i had surgery and so that kind of threw me out of whack and now there's thanksgiving and so that's the only reason i haven't done some more uh of your own of your fictional stories but please, uh, please send those in. I'm still uh, accepting them. Again, if any winter themed ones, make sure to put that in the subject line or holiday themed ones so I can get to those in a timely manner during the right part of the season. And 
What else? Oh, limited edition merch. I'll say it once more. Sorry. It's only until the third. I know if you're a little annoyed about hearing me say it, I'm really excited about this design. I'm really excited for you all to purchase it. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned why last week. I'm not going to go into it again because we already had Bleak Corner. We already had Bleak Corner. Don't need to mention it. Just buy, if you can, buy my cool limited edition merch. It's really neat. I really love it. It's so, it's, it's honestly meant a lot to me. The, the website I, pair, I partnered with Bonfire, who you would be purchasing the merch from, they reached out to me and were like, hey, we like what you got going on. Do you want to partner up and do this cool, like, we'll do art for you. And I'm like, yes. And I've never had anyone do that before. And the art is so cool. It's my severed head. It's a haunted house. There's little ghosts coming out of it. There's a graveyard. There's a book. The lettering looks cool. It's just so neat. I love the color, the, that blue. It was like I chose between a couple colors of the design, and I love the blue. It's like such a perfect ghostly blue, and it comes in to- so many different styles, like merch design, like tank tops, and two different types of hoodies, a couple different types of t-shirts, um, uh, let's see, long sleeve shirts, crew neck, and I did a variety of colors as well. I personally think the blue, that design looks cool on like a purple background, or the like forest green or the navy it looks really neat with the navy you'd think it'd be too much blue but it's not the d- the deep navy with the blue the lighter blue design looks very nice together and i've seen a few people ordering the navy so i'm glad you all think so as well but of course there's the classic black or white um so thank you so much for ordering that merch ahead of time you're i said it before but you're absolute angels you're absolute angels for <laughs> ordering that and for listening here today, whether you're listening on Patreon, which patreon.com slash Gary Sleep, if you'd like to become a Patreon member, or if you're listening on the main feed where you're these ads that you skip, which look, we all skip ads. I don't fault you. Skip them all you want. These ads help me so much. So I'm just really grateful for you. It's it's Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you in this show, and I'm thankful for for you. You're the most, you're what I'm most thankful for. Honestly, like honest to God, I am most thankful for you. And so, uh, uh, let's see. Did I skip anything? Did I miss anything? I don't know. This isn't like a super long episode, but again, I am recording this ahead of time for the holiday and you're at the holiday. Maybe you have a 45 minute commute to, you know, aunt Betty Lou's house and you put this on, throw this on or There's a 45-minute commute back, and uh, you don't want to say a word because, wow, that that dinner went crazy. Oh, I will be. It's coming out, let's see, the 25th, so it's already out now as you're hearing this. But we, I was once again on the Bloody Disgusting podcast, and we all talked about our favorite Thanksgiving-themed horror movies. And it's a fun episode. We had so much fun. Uh, I told a story about when I was in retail and I got a shoe thrown at me, which I've told on this show before, but if you haven't heard it, go listen over there. And it was me and Zena, of course, your best friend, um, your best horror friend, Zena, and Pacific Obadiah and Alex DiVincenzo. And we all had a blast. We each brought five different of our favorite Thanksgiving horror movies, or at least Thanksgiving adjacent. I had a few that I had to I had to argue for, okay, I'm not going to lie, but uh, we had a, we, we had a great time. So go listen to that too. If you need some more, some Thanksgiving themed stuff to get your mind off things or just cause maybe you're having a fucking, I don't know why. I don't know why I'm assuming I have a great time at Thanksgiving. Maybe you're having a great time too. And you just want to throw this on cause you love it. And I hope you're all eating lots. And to all my listeners who don't celebrate Thanksgiving, have a you also deserve pie have some pie it doesn't have to be thanksgiving to have some pie have some pie okay i'm gonna go uh drink your water have your pie and go get some sleep sweet dream